Today I'll be interviewing Doug Kulunga. Doug is from the Congo, although he came to the United States to attend college when his American family, as he calls them, brought him here to educate him and take care of him and give him a better future. His dad was a congressman in the Congo, and when he died, Doug was automatically given that position in his place. He died before his term had been fulfilled. So Doug is currently serving as a congressman in the Congo, and he also is the executive director of Wellbeing, an organization that is building wells in the Congo, as there are millions of people in the Congo who do not have access to fresh water. Today we'll be talking about Doug's life story and his ministry. Mm. So welcome Thank to so the Rachel Ham Show. We're so excited to have you, you here. So okay, so I would like you to mm. first mm. tell us who you are okay. and a little bit about your your history, mm -hmm. your family, mm -hmm. and your personal life. Thank you so much. First, I want to thank you for just giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, you know God, uh, my country, both actually my country is America and Congo, and because I live been living here for the last eighteen years. And, and say uh, your name, because I was going to say your name, but I didn't know how to pronounce your last name. So if you Yes, can... so my name is Doug Kulungu. In French, you say Doug. Okay. Uh, Kulungu is uh, my last name. Um, I was born and raised uh, in the Congo. It's, yeah, so I was born and raised in the Congo. I came to America in, in 2005 as a student. So How old were you? Um, I was 22. Okay. And now I'm 40, so I, I guess I'm getting old. Mm -hmm. Me too, so 47. <laughs> I just turned 47. Oh, wow. You don't look 47. You look younger. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I um, I was brought to America by uh, my American family, the Hansons, Eric and Darlene Hanson. When you say uh, your American family, meaning they were like hosting you? They, they, uh, they brought me here. They sort of, uh, like a better word, like adopted me, brought me here, put me in school, wanted me to be successful. So they so went they, to Congo and met you there. No, no, no. Or, okay. My my dad. Maybe I should start there. My okay. dad went to school at Fresno Pacific okay. many years ago. So your biological dad. Yes, okay. uh, through the connection, he met uh, 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 Hanson Senior. Harold passed away uh, last last year. Um, they became a good friend. They start shipping containers of medical supplies around the world, and through the relationship that I got to come to to America. So okay. that's how my American family invited me to come in 2005. It was through the relationship that I ended up being here. Okay. Yes. And they invited you to come and just like spend go to school. Some, oh, to go to I Fresno went to Fresno Pacific. Pacific. Yes. So Fresno I came. Pacific. I came with uh, what we call a F1 visa, which is a student visa. Mm -hmm. So I came to uh, to go to school. Mm -hmm. So I went to Fresno Pacific. Um, I'm coming from a family of six kids. I'm the second. We are four boys and two girls. And married to uh, my wife, Patience. And your wife um, is beautiful. Thank you so much. I got to meet thank his you. wife, and she was <laughs> she was beautiful. Thank you. So we have um, we have uh, two kids, two boys, Jason and Eric. So um, I serve in Congress back in Congo, um, but I also started a ministry from scratch here in Fresno. Uh, well, being now, so been living in Fresno for the last eighteen years. Um, so I do part of kind of three months in Fresno, three months in Congo, because Congress in Congo meet twice a year. And it's about, we meet for about three months, we off for three months. And when I'm off, that's when I'm back to Fresno, which is like my second home. So that's, uh, I'm 40 years old um, and I'm very ambitious, dreaming about to see what God will do for Congo and Africa. And I'm excited to see what the future looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm grateful to be living in America, so. So what form of government does the Congo have? Well, the government, the, the Congo is more like a republic, just like America, where you have a, you have different branches of power, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, from the president, from both houses and Senate and the House itself and so on. We have a president, we have a prime minister, we have two chambers, uh, you know, the, the Senate and uh, the House. Um, we are like baby in terms of democracy. We are learning even how to be uh, a de Democrat, uh, as to say. So we have still have a lot of way to go because we just this is we have election this year. This is our third, I think, or fourth time that we're holding elections. So our first election was in 2006. So we like a baby. Yeah. We went through a lot of trial in the past. You know, we used to be known as Zaire by the time Mobutu was the president for 32 years. So we went through a lot of crisis. So we're kind of building on a better ground just to see what God will do for our country and so on. 
So in oh. America, there's a lot of concern about corruption in the government and about how honest and fair mm -hmm. our republic really is right now. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about the government in Congo? Is it, do you have uh, confidence that you have honest elections and that things are not well, so corrupt? <laughs> well, no, no, no. When you talk about corruptions, you see that in Africa. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's big. Um, in Congo, in the past, we had a lot of government officials that were really corrupt. Mm -hmm. There was still a lot of money used for themselves and, you know, and they would kill people just to get mineral and so on. Right now, we have a better president who's really fighting for countries, working for a country. Our president, Chisikedi, who's a Christian man as well. Mm. He, uh, he, he been just, his, this is the first time he's running again in December. Uh, it's the first time ever in Congo where they can arrest um, a politician if he steal money. Mm. Like we had people going to jail for, for 10 years, 15 years. And you now we have the president speaking on TV pretty much every other week and talking about if you get arrested, you go to jail. Like we're not playing it on. And, and World Bank, IMF been giving Congo kind of a uh, good rating in terms of accountability, integrity and honesty. So we are a better Congo than we used to be. Uh, I'm not saying that there is no corruption in Congo. There's still corruption in Congo mm -hmm. because it's it just like, I mean, it's like a disease. It's mm -hmm. like a disease. You can't really, you cannot legislate morality. Yes. So uh, that's where the family, the foundation of the family became essential to us who are even Christians. Mm -hmm. Because when people are raised with those moral, with, uh, you know, great value, and, and as they grow up, become leaders, they will reflect on that. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important to, to instill that into our kids as we're raising them in schools, in churches, whatever they are. So if they end up in the government tomorrow, they don't have to use the government money for themselves and, mm -hmm. or steal for the people and so on. Well, um, and the, the not being able to legislate morality is part of when I, when I was running for secretary of state, mm -hmm. I would talk about election integrity because mm -hmm. the secretary of state is in charge mm -hmm. of, our, of our elections. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was talking about election integrity a lot, but I would only do that about half the time. Mm -hmm. And then the other half the time I would preach. Because oh, I would wow. say um, our only hope mm. is a spiritual awakening and revival. Mm. That's not, we're not going to be able to legislate mm. our mm. way out of this situation. No, no, no. This is a, a mm. moral mm. crisis, a spiritual crisis mm. that the American well, government and church, mm. I see. Well, all of society, really. Mm. I mean, as you, know, as you drift away from God, mm. it stops working out. Not... There we go. Well, on the surface, on the surface, America for me has shifted um, mm -hmm. the American value. Um, I might sound like a conservative, but uh, um, I think, so I was born in a conservative family. Mm -hmm. My parent, our, my dad was very conservative. And my mom, they were very strict. Um, you know, how how in America it's play, where you calling your kids my friends. We don't play that in Africa. Your mm -hmm. kids are not your friend. Your kids are kids. Yes. And then and as soon as you start calling them your friend, you cannot impose any restriction on them because you guys are friends. Mm -hmm. Friends don't impose restriction on friends. Mm -hmm. Friends hang out and play around. Right. Parents are not your friends. They are your parents for purpose. Mm -hmm. They have the ability to bring you into the world. They're not going to take you out of the world because that's illegal. But <laughs> they have to prepare you to raise you well so that tomorrow they pass you the baton. And that's the legacy moving forward. So I was very fortunate to be raised by... Uh, my parents, who, who were Mennonite, missionary, came and trained them. On, mm -hmm. And that's how we received the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, so those kind of principles kind of helped me as I was growing up. And, and even I came to America, uh, I was uh, living on campus, on the dorm, but I, I was still reflect on the teaching from my parents. Like, mm -hmm. how do you, my father would usually talk about his reputation. He would talk about his name. Uh, he would talk about... Now, how do you talk in public? How do you represent me well in school, like in church, whatever you got, you are carrying my name. That's my name. You're going to have morality. You're going to have value. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and, and this country right here, America was known for that. Because um, all the missionaries that came to Congo were very conservative. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we were raised like, you can't go to a church for like a, a short, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. Or like uh, like a minister, or whatever. No, because they say no. You're gonna cover your body when you mm -hmm. go to church, and mm -hmm. when you're in public, don't curse anybody. So when I came to Fresno Pacific, I was a little bit shocked because I realized that most of the teaching that the missionary brought to Congo, I didn't find that in America. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And then I would be confused. I would talk to a couple of missionary that I knew and I'm like, but you guys used to say this, I'm saying this year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think that's where we're losing. Uh, we're losing on the family. Mm -hmm. You know, we're losing in the family restrictions. And, and America wanna define family by based on the American uh, emancipation, which is wrong. Uh, a family is not an American deal. Family is God's deal. Mm -hmm. It came from the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and then as it come from the Bible, each country is is picking a portion of the, the scriptures to use it to, to shape even the policy around those uh, ideas, um, which now most people might call conservative ideas. But those are the values that come from the Bible, mm -hmm. from Old Testament, mm -hmm. you know? And that that's shaped us as, as we're growing up. And, and, and we're having this theory where people wanna change you know you you don't have to be this you got to create you this you have to decide to be who you are and you came i'm i get confused when when people in america you know english is not my language i'm already struggling to speak it. but when when i'm meeting people who are telling me on monday he's a he on wednesday she's a she on wednesday I'm, i get confused because mm -hmm. it's not really my, my, my language already mm -hmm. so it's just like you're putting me into confusion because mm -hmm. i'm really like, you were here yesterday no i'm hers now okay so, <laughs> so I think that's somehow uh, it's a little bit hard. And again, I'm African. I wasn't born here, so I would disagree. Uh, being respectful with other people who don't have same opinion than myself, uh, and then the only way I can back my 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 standing is based on my value and how I was raised. And I can be, you know, people can call me names because you believe that because, but. I'm proud of the person that I've become. And I'm proud of my parents because those values that they installed in me when I was a little kid, I talk about it when I talk to my kid. You know, I'm playing with them, but I'm saying my dad used to be, be used to say, be professional wherever you go, you know, be respectful, mm -hmm. you know, say sorry, say excuse. And, and when you talk to somebody who's earlier than you, or you don't wear your cap, your cap, you know, your hat, take it off and shake hand politely, you know. And, Things like those are small, basic things, mm -hmm. but I believe those are the foundation of each kid. When we can, we start, as we start raising you from your, your your parent home, for you to go outside and going back to corruption in Africa, and, and then when you become a leader, you know that your daddy used to tell you, "Don't do this, do this," mm, because family really and value really start from from the family. Mm -hmm. If you fail at home, then it's a mess. School won't fix nothing. Mm -hmm. You are spending only what four hours or three hours a day at school while in the congo in the Here congo it's the more, it's like seven or something okay let's yeah. even take seven hours yeah. a day mm -hmm. or eight but so you realize the kids spend more time at home with parents mm -hmm. uh, so at school is a few hours if the teacher doesn't have good morality good value the kid is a mess mm -hmm. so we are to make sure that from home we need to have to set good example good teachings good value so that even they go to school, they won't be changed that easily. That's why I support a lot of parents that do homeschooling mm -hmm. because they want to have control over the kids, how well they are raised to well uh, represent them and so on. So that's how I can answer it. It was a long answer <laughs> to uh, the question about corruption and so on. Yes. Okay, so as far as the spiritual climate of the Congo versus America, how would you compare? Like, how is Christianity in Congo? Is it somewhat predominant? Is it a small percentage of people would say they're Christian? Um, is society being shaped by the church in Congo? So mm. I'm curious about the comparison because you go back and forth between America and Congo. So yes. Yes. how do you see Christianity and its its mm. um, place in society yes. in those two? Well, in Congo, um, for my family, we got to know about Christ to be American missionary and Canadian missionary who came with Mennonite. Mm -hmm. So that's how we became Christian. Um, um, beside the gospel itself, in Africa, just there is a sense of fear of God, whether you're a Christian or not. Uh, and that that's goes even to our values. And um, just when you hear God, there's a certain fear. Even our pastors mm -hmm. in Africa, we fear our pastors. Mm -hmm. If you compare it to America. You feed them, is that what you said? Fear. Fear them. Fear them. Oh, like, so like respect. Respect. Okay. Because we just don't respect our parents, but we also fear our parents. Mm -hmm. That's in Africa. Mm -hmm. That's what I say, you know, we don't call our parents friends. No, mm -hmm. it don't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, yes. So 
Now about the gospel itself. Um, I feel like the, the church in America is becoming weak. Mm -hmm. That's just my observation for the last uh, 18 years that I've been living here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, why I see that, why I think that way, it's because it was the American people that brought the gospel to us many years ago. And then it was all about salvation. It was all about John 3.16. Uh, you know, for God so loved the world and so on and and gave his son. Whoever believed in him will not perish, but will have eternal life and so on. Um, that, there was a sense of joy uh, when you go to a church and then uh, knowing that, uh, you know, the pastor is pointing you to the cross each Sunday and talking about redemption, talking about in the Congo, you're talking in the about. Congo yes, okay. mm -hmm. talking about salvation and talking because we learned that from America. Mm -hmm. But I feel that America is shifting, mm -hmm. if I can compare. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like Congo, there's a lot of poor people in Congo who are poor in terms of material blessings, mm -hmm. you know, house, you know, vehicle, money, whatever. In America, there's a lot of people with a lot of money, but less joy. Mm -hmm. America is stress. stress. America, yeah, too mm -hmm. much stress. Yes. Uh, there's no happiness in America. Yeah. There's no joy in America. Mm -hmm. There is just work and work and busy and busy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. people make money that they don't have time to use, to mm -hmm. spend. Mm -hmm. They work until they die. Mm -hmm. And then family will be fighting for whatever they leave behind. Yeah. They don't take much time with family. And then um, uh, when you go to a church in America, you don't find people screaming, shouting joy. No, nobody's doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Christian, American Christians are very conservative when it's time to worship. Mm -hmm. When you look, even there are songs that they sing, they say, shout to the Lord, but nobody's shouting. Yeah. Everybody's quiet. Nobody's clapping. Mm -hmm. it, uh, if you clap, you become a distraction. Everybody will look at you weird, like, mm -hmm. why are you clapping? Yeah. Um, I'm very demonstrative in worship. And so I often will. You must be African. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I would love Africa, yeah. actually. <laughs> but um, I feel sometimes in certain Set, yes. settings I feel awkward mm -hmm. yes because everyone else is not that way so it's like then I don't want to be a distraction yeah so mm -hmm. that's the thing it just like it's like every Sunday in America the message is about God's love God loves us God loves us God loves us yeah that's what I've been hearing mm -hmm. they don't talk about God's wrath mm -hmm. no no mm -hmm. Roman 1 talking about God's wrath chapter 1 I think from verse 16 to 20 to 32 Paul is talking about those things mm -hmm. In America, we don't talk about that. Um, if you talk a lot about that, you're judging people. Mm -hmm. Why are you judging people? You know, God, don't judge. Mm -hmm. I'm a sinner. Uh, I'm a sinner. And, but I would love my pastor to tell me about the consequences of sin every Sunday. Mm -hmm. That is helping me. Mm -hmm. So I'll know that, wow, so I really have to change. I really have to change. But if you're petting me every Sunday, God loves me. So yeah. I'm just thinking I'm okay. You yeah. know, God loves me anyway. You know, God loves me. I'm a good guy. You know, when I was a kid, um, I think the pendulum was kind of the other extreme. There's yeah. a lot of like hellfire, brimstone, judgment. Mm -hmm. And then it swung way far to the other extreme. Now it's all grace. Yes. It's like we need to come somewhere Which in the Which is middle. good. It's good to talk about God's grace. It's good. God's yes. grace and God's mercy. We love that. But there's more to it. Uh, but yeah, but I think it's just, and and I feel like the church in America is, is, is lazy. Mm -hmm. Most selfish. Of, yeah, lazy and selfish and... And Christian in America, we just don't want to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how often do we preach the gospel? How often do we make disciples? Mm -hmm. How often do we take a risk for Jesus? Mm -hmm. You know, just go to downtown Fresno and go preach the gospel on the street or just go to a third world country and share about God's love. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we make the gospel like it, it's an American business. Jesus was American. You know, we're good of Jesus as soon as long as we pay taxes. We're good. No. Jesus say American. The Bible is not an American book. Mm -hmm. It's global. So, and when he says go into the world and make disciples, when we don't go and make disciples, we meaning Christians, and we have a problem. When pastors don't want to go and preach the gospel, they're comfortable here. You hear a pastor talking about, you know, I feel like God called me to be here in my city. No, that's a lie. God never called somebody to be local. I don't, I mean, if there's a scripture, I want to read the scripture and understand it. Maybe I have a wrong understanding. But when he's saying you'll be, you be my ambassador in Judea, in Jerusalem, and to the end of the world, mm -hmm. he's talking about the entire earth. Mm 
-hmm. You know, we have to continue with that. And but, but like you said, if the American church is more like a business, if you think about it, if you're a businessman, then you need to contemplate how to have a successful business. Well, yes. you got to keep your customers happy. There we go. If you have a successful business, yes. right? So I think a lot of pastors have the mentality of how do I maintain a, a happy, a happy church yes. where they continue to give their time yes. so that the yes. bottom line is yes. met. And of course, not all pastors. There's a lot no, of no, no. There's good it's, ones. It's, there's some good there's, pastors here, yeah. even Fresno, good people that I hang with and who want to preach the gospel, want to uh, come alongside. Have you heard him. Francis Chan, though, talking yeah, about Yeah, I love Francis Chan. Okay, so he's saying he believes we should stop having a church where there's any paid staff. It should go to home churches and no paid staff, just a small church, home churches people. all over, okay. and then using your money for other things like missions and and doing other that sounds like uh, uh act chapter two i think the first church yeah. you know they were home and so on because well i might be wrong again i mean in america they spend these millions of dollars building building for church i mean i just i just look at it, i'm like wow oh really okay mm -hmm. like why would you spend 40 million on the building yeah well you can spend the 40 million making disciples mm -hmm. around the world showing mm -hmm. god love in terrible country you think jesus is placed by building like what gospel is that? No, like you tell a friend of mine told me, yeah, Doug, but you know, we in America, we America like comfortable. We have to be comfortable. You know, we want something beautiful and comfortable. Oh yeah, do you think that building will make it to heaven? No. Why are you putting millions on that building while people are starving? Mm -hmm. When people don't have the gospel, and you just gonna spend fifty million on one building, mm -hmm. and you think God is pleased with that? Mm -hmm. No, I don't. I don't know, but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I'm thinking as an African because mm -hmm. I live in poverty. I see poverty every day. So, what are the yeah. churches like in Congo? Do you meet in a building? We meet, meet in a building, but it's very simple. It's no. First, we don't have money. We pool. It's, mm -hmm. it's a small building for us. It looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's in the city. But when you go in the village, it's worse because there are there are churches in the village that don't have a roof. Mm -hmm. And when it rains, it rains, we have to run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, believe me, the worship service in that thing, mm -hmm. better than any American church. I believe you. First, we don't have an instrument. We just, if it's a table, using a table. Mm -hmm. But the gimmicks that come of those instruments and the joy, the dancing in the church, the people singing and praising God, man, you be, um, God is, into, is not into this fancy stuff. So why do you think there's so much more joy in the Congo church? Not just in the Congo church, but in most of the African church, if not even South America is the same situation. Mm -hmm. Because I realize... When a lot we, of places in the world, I think, yeah, are better. Poor than, people. Yes. Are more happier than American. Yes. Why? Because Americans have so much. Mm -hmm. When you have so much, you know, so much money, so much, how everything is two, three, three car, four car, big houses, now the problem is what you're thinking that should cover the void in your heart. No, no. That's why you see <laughs> even myself got corrupt. How? When there is a new iPhone, I want to get a new iPhone. We're thinking iPhones will bring joy and happiness. Mm -hmm. We want a new, new iPhone. There's iPhone 50. All of us go get iPhone 50. Mm -hmm. Next week, iPhone 100 is out. Every, oh, that one is better. The camera is better. If you get that one, you're good to go. We make excuses to buy new stuff. Honey, you know, my job is into taking pictures. I need beautiful pictures. I think this one, no, you just want to get the iPhone. Mm -hmm. So so when, when you have so much, you don't rely on God. Mm -hmm. Because your mind is teaching you how to live without depending on God. The devil is telling you, you don't need no God. You're good, bro. You got money. You got doctors. You got a few numbers. You can call whatever you need. Why do you have to pray? Mm -hmm. Like, now, why do you pray God in America? I don't get it. Why would somebody need man, uh, God in America? Because America offers you everything you need. If you don't have a job, you have welfare system. You go get a check every month for free. EBT, you get food. Mm -hmm. If you don't have money, you go. You get a scholarship. You go, you go to college. If you are sick, you go to hospital. When do the American people need God? That's when I want to know. Like what, I what would time? say the mm -hmm. emotional bankruptcy is what would drive someone to God. There we go. Because you, if you have everything and you realize, oh, I thought this was going to make me happy and it doesn't, 
Now what? I think in a way that could be what leads people now, to Now non-Christian now go into drugs, a lot of drinking, yes, a lot yeah, of drugs, because yeah. they cannot rely on God. They don't know that. The American culture doesn't teach dependence on God. No. They say you got to work hard. Mm -hmm. You're going to work hard. You can make it. And yeah. what do they say? Pull your own boots, uh, boot trip, I think. Yeah, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. The bootstrap. Yeah. So that's the thing. Now, in third world countries, there is no 911. There is no EBT. There is not a government entity that provides milk. No, it doesn't exist. Or shelter. We don't have that. Now, people from that age of being a kid going to learn how to trust God. Mm -hmm. And then... I remember my story. My, my mother will usually remind me when we're dreaming about coming to America, she'll say, we just have to pray about it. We have to seek God and mm -hmm. keep on praying. Mm -hmm. We don't have money. We don't have, we're poor, but God will show up one day. And it became like each Saturday we pray, seeking God, praying about God, please open the door for us. Because everything mom will say, we need to pray about it. Everything pray about it. Because there is no any other options besides praying right. about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's then teach you how to depend on God yep. when you go to a church knowing that God has answered not a prayer. We have testimony on Sundays. We have some, the pastor will be like, who has something to testify about what God has done for him this week? Mm -hmm. So people get up and say, you know what? I was sick. I didn't have medicines, but I pray. Mm -hmm. I got healed. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have food for three days. Then the friends show up and provide for us. Oh, wow. Look at God is working. Yeah. My mother was sick and this and that happened. My son. Well, so it just like when I'm hearing you testifying about what God has done for you. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go pray about my case. Wow. Well, if you did that for Rachel, so you can do something for well, me. Well, your faith is so strengthened, you know, when you hear someone else's testimony. Oh, yes. Now you have faith for yes. whatever you're doing. Yes. With. So I think that's what we lack in America. Mm -hmm. You know, we when when if I see you sick, you say, "Oh, Doug, I'm sick." I'm like, "Oh, you know what? I'll pray about you." I'm I'm just lying. Mm -hmm. I'm time. gonna go and forget about it. Mm -hmm. It's better for me to pray right now. Yes. Let's pray about it now. I agree. Um, so I think we, the American church and the African church, we have to work together to help each other. So I think the Congo needs to send missionaries to America. That's what I'm about to say. Okay. America sent missionary in Africa yeah. to preach the gospel. It's time for the African to come to America. Mm -hmm. And then, well, here you are. Because <laughs> if I preach, like, if you give me a chance to preach, I'll talk mm -hmm. about, I'll preach about things that American preachers don't want to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you get mad at me, I'm sorry, I'm African. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I have a different perspective. You have a different perspective, but I, I do respect you and I love you. But I think this is what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's the big difference. So I don't have to, you know, we don't have to cuddle, like, you know, church members to make them feel great. And we're not helping them. Yeah. You know, and um, so you see, that's why we see a lot of suicide in the church in America. Mm -hmm. Pastors are killing themselves, taking their own life. Suicide, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's um, pastors don't have friends. They're usually lonely people. They don't know who to trust. Yeah, they're very burnt out yeah. and yeah. miserable. Yeah. Just too much. And then, and, and then how many pastors in America depend on prayer? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's just like the prayer life usually maybe is weak. Yeah. Because everything is smart. It's book, good presentation, good... I haven't heard about people buying sermon online. Yeah. You're going to preach on Sunday. You don't know what to preach. You just spend a hundred bucks. You buy a sermon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. you don't have to pray and get it from God. You can just buy that, it online. That, that's a joke. Yeah. yeah. That's a joke. I mean, go for a walk and talk to God. Mm -hmm. I'm preaching on Sunday. What am I going to talk about? Mm -hmm. Or just use me as you want to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm assuming if you read the Bible a lot, you don't have to prepare to go preach. Paul said, be prepared in season as well as out of season. Mm -hmm. So they can wake you up at 3 a.m. and say, preach, you should be ready. Mm -hmm. As soon as you just wash your face and be like, okay, so what's going on? Okay, well, you know what? God has a plan for all of us. Or God wants us to do because you've been reading the Bible. You've been praying the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was talking to disciples, he says, when, you go, when they take you to court, don't worry about what you're going to talk about because yeah. the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. Yeah. How often do we rely on the Holy Spirit in America? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Do we even recognize the Holy Spirit here? I don't know. So have you heard the term, the ecclesia or the remnant? Have you heard that term in, in, in regards to the American church? Oh. There's, a, there's a group of people all over the country mm -hmm. that we refer to ourselves as the remnant. Mm -hmm. Most of us are not in churches, in traditional churches. Mm -hmm. We're mostly in home churches or mm -hmm. other uh outside of the kind of traditional mm. four walls of the church. Mm. And um, we're passionate mm. about the mm. Lord. And um, 
So there, I think there is this, we call it the remnant because it's just a tiny percentage, mm. you know, of, of people who are actually Christians. Mm. But for those people of the ones that I know that I would put into that category of being mm. the remnant mm. and a lot of the people who watch my show mm -hmm. are in that category, mm. uh, they are in love with mm. the Lord and they're hungry for mm. America to mm. be uh, mm. what God wants it to be. Mm. And I think are mostly doing their part to it's try to thing. see that it's, happen. It's a good thing. About, yeah. My advice has been, Every American person should have a friend from a third world country. Mm -hmm. Every American Christian should have a Christian friend from a third world country. Yeah. And they should meet often, mm. maybe once a month, once every two months. And why? Because the friend from a third world country might be from Malawi, might be from uh, South America, you know, Cuba or whatever, Guatemala, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they were born in poverty. They have learned how they have learned to survive in hard times. Mm -hmm. Not most Americans can survive tribulations. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. The American mind is, with due respect, is really weak when you go through a uh, uh, struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no sense of resilience. Uh, that's where people take out, they take their own life easily here. Mm -hmm. Well, when you have everything already, that's people from third world country envy. Why do you kill yourself? When you go to third world country, these people are poor or suffering. They don't take their own life. Because mm -hmm. they're mentally strong. They're mentally strong. Mm -hmm. they're, so what is it that the friend from the third world country, like, so I'm an American, mm -hmm. you're from a third, third world country. country. Yes. Okay. So what is it that you feel like you could specifically help? Like when you say get together once a month. Okay. Why? What would you Just talk would about you life. Do? talk about life, just ask him about his life experience. Mm -hmm. um, to gain perspective. To gain perspective. Don't just talk about the gospel itself. Talk about life. Might not be a Christian, mm -hmm. but just be, you might make him a Christian later on, help him to become a Christian. Just be his friend mm -hmm. or her friend. Talk about life. Talk about struggles. Mm -hmm. uh, ask him about what he has gone through, the, the hard times in life, like, and then learn from that. Mm -hmm. um, when, this, when a kid is born in America, the parent got to save money in the bank for him. So when he's 18, give him money to go to college. On a monthly basis, some parent can, I don't know, 100 bucks, 200, whatever, 500 bucks. On a yearly basis, depending on how much they're making in terms of income. But you get safe for your kids mm -hmm. as they're growing up. You do that. In Africa, they don't do that for us. Mm -hmm. We don't, our parents don't even have bank. Mm -hmm. They don't have banking in the, the village. They don't spare money for us. No, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We don't even have a meal for tomorrow. How are you going to save money for me for college? Yeah. So we live by faith. You know, we live by faith, literally by faith, mm -hmm. because faith alone prevails in Africa. Faith alone. Oh, uh, we don't so have. You mentioned about the uh, the the what was it called? The prosperity gospel. Yes. Is you said pray? It's coming down into Africa. Yes. Africa. Okay. Explain specifically what the prosperity gospel is in your in your. I mean, I've heard of the term, mm -hmm. and I think I kind of know what it means. Mm -hmm. But explain to me what that means, because you were concerned. Yes, it's prosperity coming. gospel is when you're telling somebody, um, "Well, you become a Christian, God will bless you for home." And you, in Africa, usually they will tell you, "If you trust God, if you come, you become a Christian. God will give you a visa to go to America mm. to study and become somebody." If you trust God, he will buy you a car. He'll give you a job. You know, if you become a Christian, God will give to God. He will double your blessings. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, pastors have been using this in Africa to steal from people. Mm -hmm. So when I'm already poor and I only have 50 bucks and you're telling me if I give to God, since it's God, you know, these people use the scriptures to get money out of your pocket. And they'll say, you see, God multiply the bread and fish. Jesus can multiply anything. So if you have 50 bucks today, who have $50 right now? Everybody put their hands up. We have 100, 100 up. So the philosophy is mm -hmm. you give 100 bucks, God will multiply that. So I'm giving you 100 bucks, maybe in a month or the week. I don't know when God am I giving you 1,000. So it's just a manipulative way to... It's a way to explore poor people. And you know, it happens here too. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. The, I, yeah, I, I, I watch that in America. I've seen yeah. a few pass on TV and... yeah. A uh, pastor want to buy a jet. He's just like, uh, he yeah. already have a jet, but he has a better, he, he wants a newer, better, better jet. And he actually said it. I, I watched it actually I say, the video, say that. Yes. Yeah. Like, and then he, yeah. the guy made a joke. He's like, 
If Jesus Christ was alive today, he would not ride on the donkey. He would ride it on the jet. <laughs> so, so you see, so when you think about it as a business guy, you'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus now maybe will need a jet. We'll guy buy him 100 million jet maybe so he can fly faster to go preach or whatever. I don't know. Uh, so it's it just a prosperity gospel. So mm -hmm. the idea is to get people back to John 3, 16. Because mm -hmm. the, gosp the gospel is about salvation. It's about saving our souls. It's about life after death. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not about uh, what we're going to have here on earth and so on. So I will emphasize on making friendship with people from third world country because it helps you learn from each other's the perspective, uh, the struggle. We're going to talk about our challenges. We're going to talk about our struggles. And so it's it just like they say, I am... Um, what Iron is sharp and Iron sharp and there we go. Because mm -hmm. when we have problems and then and, and, and we're talking to each other's we can learn from our experience. Mm -hmm. um, when we went to Fresno Pacific, me of, and uh, many of my African friends who will sit on the campus and just start laughing. We can sp half of the day afternoon when we're done with our classes, we're just sitting outside and laughing. And usually we'll laugh at the American. Hmm. We'll be like, look, American are stressed out. <laughs> look how they're working. They don't smile, they don't laugh. They don't la laughing loud like us. Yeah. Because they said they only have problems. Mm. They worry too much. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. what would happen if this? And we'll be like, why do you guys worry so much? Like, they'll be like, you guys don't worry. We're, like, we're African. What do we have to worry about? Mm -hmm. Like, all our life, we've just been like this already. So yeah. we don't, what are we going to worry about? What, what am I going to lose? Mm -hmm. That, like, I don't really, I don't have, I don't control anything. What am I going to lose if I worry? Nothing. Mm -hmm. So I think poverty helps you to be strong spiritually. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, I grew uh, up very poor. Uh, so, um, and I am grateful that I yes, grew up poor. I yes. really am. Yeah. Because I have a um, proper perspective of what actually there matters. Go. There we go. And we had to depend on the Lord. Yes. Even we, though we're in America, we yeah, yeah. still had to pray Definitely. for our needs to Definitely. be met. And Definitely. so, so I that's important. It. So that's why you really have to encourage American people to pray and trust God and to go to mission trips and go see uh, your brothers and sisters around the world and learn from them and, and bless them with the word of God. And by going, Needs in third world countries are opportunity for Americans to be involved and be blessed. Mm -hmm. Because the blessing is not just this blessing that we have here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about spiritual blessings. Yes. They're so important to us mm -hmm. uh, to be a good Christian. And, and excuse me, when you go, you see that, you leave that for yourself. It helps you to, to be like, oh, wow, so this is what they're going through. And you find it, nobody goes to Africa and remain the same. Nobody. Mm. Yeah. You go to Africa, you never remain the same. Yeah, my dad went to Swaziland, and it was life changing. Because it challenged you. When you come back to America, you learn to appreciate. Mm -hmm. I went to Mexico mm -hmm. when I was in third grade, mm -hmm. and we worked at an orphanage for a couple mm -hmm. weeks. Mm -hmm. And they had one meal a day, and mm -hmm. no parents, and one person running all these children, and all. And I, I it completely changed my life because mm -hmm. I was poor, mm -hmm. and then I went there and realized mm -hmm. I was rich. By comparison, there we go. Because I was eating more than one meal a day, yes. and yes. you know, I did have a roof over my mm -hmm. head. Technically, it, yes. was, it was small, yeah, yeah. but it was it was a roof. Yeah. So it's great mm -hmm. for gaining perspective. Yes, America is a great country. It's a blessed country, mm -hmm. um, but blessing can become destruction Absolutely. for a spiritual life, mm -hmm. and um, and we have so much in America now. We worry about losing stuff mm -hmm. when we don't. When we don't have a, a heaven perspective, we worry about losing this material stuff that we have. Mm -hmm. But when we gain an eternal, eternal perspective, and it also change how we view issues, how we view trial, how we view tribulations and hard time. Mm -hmm. What do we learn from Israel? What's going on in Israel? It can happen to America. Mm -hmm. It can happen to any country. And how do we react in those moments? How do we pray? What the Bible says about those specific moments? Um, I mean, it's it's the war is is the evil place. Um, the devil is fighting the church big time. Mm -hmm. um, Do you sense a lot of um, oppression over America here? Yes. Oh, I was a spiritual oppression. Yeah. But uh, uh, so far, spiritual oppression. So, American Christian or American church is very disrupted. Mm. It's it's no, it's it's well, it's. They, I have this perspective because I was raised in Africa, mm -hmm. and because I look at everything and I'm like, mm, this can be done different way. What is the purpose of this? What do you get out of this? Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, 
how often do we talk about tough issues? How often do we talk about hell in heaven mm -hmm. in, in churches? How often the pastor gonna take 45 minutes? First, the American church is only one hour, one hour, one hour and 30 minutes. We don't worship much mm -hmm. because we're gonna rush to go watch a football game mm -hmm. or throw a barbecue and have fun. So I've done my checklist thing, I'm out, I'm gone. Next soccer game, whatever games, it's all good, we need that. But I also believe that we need to spend time in church praying, praying and talking about hard issues. It's good to talk about God's love, but let's also talk about hell. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about God's, let's talk about Romans 1, chapter 1. Mm -hmm. You know, let's talk about all these different, uh, you know, issues that might happen. Persecution will come eventually. How do we react during persecution? Mm -hmm. Each pastor in America should send the church members to go visit their whole country, to go preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. why, would you, why would you run a church for 10 years or 20 years and you haven't been to mission trips of your church members? What are you doing? What is a church for you? Like just a football game or just like you're meeting for fun and that's it. There is a purpose into building, starting a church. You start a church to make disciples. Mm -hmm. You don't start a church to run programs. You don't start a church to hire people. Mm -hmm. That's you don't. That's not the, the church is not a business. There's a difference. Yeah, people can give you donation what they want, but you have to be out and go out and start making disciples. Go out and preaching the gospel. You don't. You don't start a church to run programs like we have. Oh, well, we have eight programs here. Who need those programs? No, let let this other government entity run programs if they want to run programs. Like the church business is making disciples, period. Yes. That's the only thing. The church is supposed to preach the gospel. The church is supposed to make disciples. So I'd rather stand December 31st of each year hearing pastor talking about, we have 1,000 new Christians in 2023. Uh, we have baptized 4,000 people or uh, 600 people went from not being Christian, becoming Christian. And you see, those numbers are very encouraging. Mm -hmm. You know, we went to this church. We plant churches in Mexico, in the village. We plant church. We have 100 members attending that church. Mm -hmm. We plant church in this city where there's no gospel. So those are numbers we need to be talking about. Yeah. Um, what about for people that are watching, that are hearing you talk about, like, that in Congo, the Christians are full of joy and and. Um, their, you know, their church services are full of life and energy and joy and that there is not that joy here and there is an, an oppression that's here. So for people who are feeling like, I want that joy, mm -hmm. but I live in America, mm -hmm. like, how do I get it? Well, you get it from reading the Bible, from singing yourself. You can sing while you're home. You can create your own joy. Mm -hmm. Just take your mind off these issues, this American investment, these stocks. First of all, if you invest in stocks every day, that's like blood pressure. <laughs> it's just blood pressure because the, the roll, it's a roller coaster, just like up and down, up mm -hmm. and down. And if you just follow that, it distracts you. Mm -hmm. um, and then learn to not worry about this material stuff. Uh, because once you take your money, your mind off your bank account and all those, whatever you have and stop worrying about that, mm -hmm. then you can have God perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, because once you have your mind on, I'm going to be successful, I'm going to make money for my family, it's a warning. You think you love your family more than God does. That's wrong. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. God loves your husband more than you do. Mm -hmm. God loves my wife the more than I do. That's the truth. Or my kids or whatever, because he's God. And even say, if you love your parent more than you love me, you already messed up. Jesus said that. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to get our mind off of those short-term investment things that we have. You're talking about Francis Chan. I was watching one video. You had this quote that was uh, white and there was a red the part where he's talking about our time on, on earth is only here mm -hmm. and the rest is eternity. So decision you make here will determine where you're going here. So I think we need to talk about issues like that. The more we talk about those issues, the better we're going to start finding joy. How do we find joy? I think David says, uh, uh, David, I think, says that the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Uh, the, joy, the joy of the Lord is when you get joy, God is the only one that can give you joy. So every you know? morning uh, I ask the Lord to give me his joy. And I say, mm -hmm. you, you told me mm -hmm. that 
your joy is my strength. So mm-hmm. I need you to give me your joy today. Mm. And then I'll just, you know, pray in tongues and kind of just pace in my mm. closet. I pray in my literal closet. Yeah. And it's mm. a, I will start getting just filled mm. with mm. a joy. Holy Spirit. And then I say, mm. what do I need to do today mm. to prosper? And prosper, I mean mm. emotionally, spiritually, spiritually, physically, mentally, relationally, okay. you know, every way yes. to, to, to live the life you created me to live. What do mm. I need to do today mm. to do that? And often he'll give me just mm. some direction for that day that's specific to mm. call this person, encourage them. They, mm. they need, you know, and then by, by encouraging them, mm. I get encouraged mm. and I get it, you know, like, cause mm-hmm. And so whatever it's, but every single day I ask the Lord, Mm. fill me with your joy. Mm. And what do I need to do today Mm. to prosper? Mm. And that keeps you in the timing of the Lord and in the blessing of the Lord, which is um, the only place worth living. Yeah. It's um, the joy that comes. uh, What I think the the book of James says, count it joy when you face trial of many kind, Mm -hmm. because trial produce perseverance, perseverance, hope. Hope doesn't lie because the Holy Spirit is living us. I think most um, Americans don't believe that scripture. Why? They don't want to suffer. So That's it says, thing. count it all joy when you're you, when you face trial. trials of many kinds. Okay, well, I think most people think I, I don't want to, I don't want a trial. Mm-hmm. Right? I had a friend of mine, you know, when I got married, it took us three years for my wife to come to, to America. Um, it was from 2015 to 2018. But I I was going to Congo to, to be and spend time with her. And a friend of mine, a good friend of mine who's American, been around me for many years, was like, Doug, I just feel like you go through a lot of issues, man. But you you are here helping people and praying, God, why are you going through issues like this? If I were you, I will give up a long time ago. Hmm. And I was like, no, man, but uh, it, this this trial shouldn't take God's love away from me. It's just a reminder for me to depend on God. That just trust God and trust God and trust God and and there was another guy who told me, he was American as well, told me, Doug, I think you need to give up. I don't think your wife will ever make it to America. <laughs> that guy almost got me depressed. I'm yeah. saying, I'm like, dude, I'm here fighting to get a visa. And then I already got married. And you're telling me you don't think she'll come. Mm-hmm. So in my mind, I'm going home thinking, what is he telling me? Like, I'm like, no. Now, I've, I've studied a friend and realized when time gets hard, he panic. Mm-hmm. Because even two years in the row where we're having our event like we did last week, mm-hmm. uh, I think a few years ago, um, he will call me and, oh, I don't think people come to event this year. I'm Who like, is telling you this? I'm this like, is terrible. Um, then they will come. He there, doesn't learn. Whoever this is, I don't like. I don't appreciate the faithlessness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, but he doesn't learn. Uh-huh. Then I will tell him no. And in my mind, I'm saying, God, I hope through me this guy can learn to trust yes. you. Yes. And then I realized like he doesn't have faith. Yeah. He worries too much. He's yeah. an American. Yeah. So every he's a pastor, he's in? no, he's not a pastor, okay. he's a Christian. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So every situation that comes, he worries. Yeah. And then then the event comes, it's packed. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. Look how many people came. <laughs> I'm like, you worry too much. The next year is back again. Oh, this year do you think I'm like, no, look, look, don't say that. And it was packed. Plus- so it just like it just like when we go through trial, when God show up, it, mm-hmm. it's a promise that he'll come back tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a promise that God will never leave us nor forsake us. But, I'll be with you. And when you uh, are in need or when you face the trials of many kind, really, a lot of times we don't see the supernatural hand of God until no. we are in a situation mm-hmm. where we have to mm-hmm. have it. Yes. In my experience, I've, yes. I've experienced a lot of su- supernatural, but it's because yes. I was in radical obedience out on the edge of a cliff doing mm. what he told me to do, mm. not you know, metaphorically. Yeah, yeah, and, no, no. Uh, and, and then you see yes. you know, the miracle. Yes. So a lot of people want the miracle part. There we go. They just don't want to be in that no, situation. No, no. They, don't yeah. they don't want trial. They don't want trial. And so that's why I'm going back to what I told you before. Like each, everybody from America should have a friend from third world country. Yeah. Because they'll tell you story. There are stories where we, where we share stories. You worry, you, you, you feel so sorry about us and mm-hmm. you panic and <laughs> but that's the life in Africa. Yeah. That's life in Africa. Yeah. And then the question would be, did God forsake Africa? No. Why God didn't allow Africa to be as rich as America is? Africa is rich in terms of mineral, yes, but in terms of this taking the raw material, turning it to people can benefit from that. We haven't got to that level yet. But I also believe that God keep Africa where it is. 
not just in poverty, but God used Africa as a training field for the world, mm. for the Christian around the world. Mm. That's my philosophy. Why? Because nobody goes to Africa and remain the same. Mm. God speak loud to you, American, when you, in, when you are in Africa. Because mm -hmm. here's too much music. Too much music, too much light. Even the stars, you can't enjoy them much in America. Mm. When you go to Africa at nighttime, you enjoy the, the stars. Mm. Because you can count, start counting. You won't finish, but you, there's so many. So I think like the, here, there's so much distraction. Mm -hmm. So much distractions, you can't hear God well. Mm -hmm. When you go to Africa, you're from America. Now, through situations, you can hear God speaking to you. See here? See what I've done here? You see what I gave you in Fresno? You don't appreciate that. But look here. These are my kids too, just like you. I love them as much as I love you. But look what they're going through. And yet, they worship me even better than you do. Because mm -hmm. when you go to church, you don't, you don't dance for me. You don't clap. You're mm -hmm. just standing there. Mm -hmm. And then look at these guys. I'm running here for me, clapping and dancing. And, and uh, so I think those, those conversations are important to learn to be joyful. Francis Chan is a great guy to be listening to. He is. He's, he's great. A great guy. He's a and great he's guy. really challenged the American church in a very appropriate way. Hmm. You know, really challenged a lot of the beliefs. He's challenged the whole building, the big building thing. Oh, he says that as well? Okay. Oh, yeah. He sold. He, he built a building and then felt horrible and sold it and started having a church outside. And uh, it talks outside about Outside is fine. Sound like Africa. Yeah. It was Under in, the tree. It was in Southern California. Now he, I think he's in San Francisco now preaching well wow. um and he, he went to hong kong for a while but now he's back yeah and just the idea of uh, spending 50 millions on one building i'm not a big fan yeah that's all over the place i'm not here. a big fan yeah um i'd rather have just a normal church where people can gather uh, i understand it's america you have standards you have everything yes uh but sometimes we spend much on building on a mission mm -hmm. the purpose is not to build mm -hmm. these buildings the purpose is to make disciples so you find a church that put only 5% or 10% to the mission mm. and the rest goes to what? The building. What is the that. purpose of that 90%? Mm -hmm. What is, so you see, that's the philosophy. That's where we get it wrong. We, all of us get it wrong. So we need to go back. Maybe it should be the other way. Making disciples should be our deal every day. Mm -hmm. Every day we should be on the field. On the, you know, making disciples, preaching the gospel, making disciples. That's what the disciples were doing. No, they were not running programs. When you, when you talk about the first church, how many programs they had? They were yeah. sharing love. I'm so, the program stuff, I'm mm. sick of it. I mean, it's just every American church, well, we got this program and that program, and that, and that, and that, all yeah. these like little circus, yes. circus programs. I, I, if I were pastor here in Fresno, mm -hmm. I'll get all those program people to go preach the gospel. Get what people? Get these people that run program at the church, director, oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Director, go preach the gospel. You're preaching on Sunday, on Monday, on that street. You're preaching this side. You're preaching that side. We need to be busy about making disciples because it say go into the world and make disciples mm -hmm. and teach them everything I have told you. I am with you until the very end of the time. That's that's it. when I love, when I was growing up, I loved to watch this Jesus movie. Mm -hmm. And then when he was saying that sentence, he was gone already in the sky. So to me, I'm saying, oh, so these are the last moment Jesus spent with the disciple. And he was talking to the 12. Mm -hmm. The 12 worked so hard for us to have, what, 2 billion Christians around the world or whatever. Yeah. And then look at Paul's life. Paul was busy. He didn't even get married. Mm -hmm. That was his choice. Mm -hmm. Because he really he thought marriage would be destruction to his faith. Yeah. He just wanted to... to uh, to run so hard. And Paul, he, there's a part where he's even boasting. He said, I have written more than all these 12 disciples pretty much. Because mm -hmm. he, the guy was busy, you know, traveling to different places, going through persecution, excuse me, and not renouncing his faith. And we have to follow those paths. Mm -hmm. We have to go through that. Uh, so that will keep us waiting as we're hearing about or oh, the Lord will be coming soon. It will keep us waiting? Is that awake. Oh, wait. Awake. Awake. Mm -hmm. When we hear about the Lord is coming soon or whatever, mm -hmm. when you see what happened in Israel yesterday, what are you thinking? Mm -hmm. How does that reflect your faith? Mm -hmm. What do you understand? What is the prophecy says? What do you understand from that? Mm 
So we need to talk when when Israel been bombed, each Christian each Christian church it church should talk about that. Mm -hmm. So I'm expecting next Sunday or this week to be talking about Israel mm -hmm. because it's in the Bible. It's a prophecy. Mm -hmm. it, this is happening. I know in America, many people don't believe much on prophecies. But we do actually. My viewers are because. I'm prophetic. So I, I release okay. a lot of prophecy and revelation on my show. Okay. And then um that's that's who's strong okay. here. Okay. So we, we've got a we've got some holy rollers. Okay. <laughs> so so it's it's good. Yeah. So we're gonna read the prophecy mm -hmm. and do the interpretation of the prophecy, mm -hmm. what the message, what God is telling us here, mm -hmm. and what God is telling us about Israel. What should be our attitude tomorrow or today as we reflect about what happened yesterday? So if you go to the root of the situation, you realize. Israel and but the Palestinians, if I'm not wrong, they're coming from Abraham. Mm -hmm. It's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So one is the son of, I think, of Sarah. Uh, one of the other one is the son of uh, Hagar. Hagar, Hagar or something. Hagar. Yes. Ishmael's See, and Isaac's. It's family. Or, yeah. It's family. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I don't like to get into that subject too, too or sensitive in American mm -hmm. politics. Yeah. So I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't comment much. <laughs> yes, yes, I understand. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about your well-being program? Well, well-being is a ministry we launched now about 10 years ago. Um, when I came out of France, when I came to America, I came with hope of going to school and eventually going back to Congo and making a difference. You know, the Bible says God has called us to do work for his glory. And I was sensing in me the sense of guiltiness because the scripture says to whom much is given, much is expected. Mm -hmm. You know, my American family brought me to America, put me in school at Fresno Pacific. I became who I am today. It's because of what they have done for me. Mm -hmm. And then I want to do the same thing for many other people around the world, not just people from Congo, but anybody that I can help. Mm -hmm. um, so when we launched the ministry with hope of building a better Congo, one person, one family, one region at a time. So we are drilling wells, we are, you know, running schools and so on. But the foundation of everything is the gospel, We're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are training pastors, soon we're going to be planting churches. We're equipping pastors because we, uh, we realize that the best way to change Congo is through having a strong local church. Mm -hmm. Now, about five years ago, my father passed away. He was uh, a congressman mm -hmm. and then in Congo, the constitution allows you to hire uh, an assistant when you're running for office. So if anything will happen to you, then the assistant become the congressman. Mm. Uh, and so your dad hired you to be his assistant? My father, yes, pretty much picked me to be his assistant. Mm -hmm. So when he passed away, I became the congressman. So now my district has about 2 million people. Oh, wow. 2 million people. Large. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's the largest district in common term of size. Okay. Now, most of the people in my district, most of the churches, as a, as a Christian guy, I'm going back to the church, most of the pastors only have high school diploma. Mm -hmm. So we want to change Congo, realize the best way to change Congo is through having a strong local church, having pastors, and we're preaching the gospel in the district, and in the capital, we are working with different congressmen to have small Bible study, where we're talking about the gospel. I want to run Congo based on first and second uh, book of Samuel. You know, Samuel was working very close to Saul. Saul was the king. Mm -hmm. And then Samuel was the bridge between Saul and God. Mm -hmm. So I believe we need to consult God whenever we're dealing with government issues. We messed up when we walk away from God. That's why we must start making policies that don't reflect on God. So my philosophy is we're gonna change Congo. Even as a politician, I want change in Congo to come through the church, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that changed the heart. And when we change the heart, then we can have, make better policy, better decision of what we want to do. So we are drilling wells, giving water to people. More than 50 million people in Congo don't have clean water. Mm. In my district, it's 2 million people. We have about five to six wells in a district that has 2 million people. So people, kids die because of lack of clean water, too many diseases because of that. So our ministry is helping to raise funds and go and preach the gospel and drill well for these people. So that's what we So how much does it cost to drill one well? It costs uh, 15,000, one five, uh, 15,000 to drill a well. Mm -hmm. And one well serve about 2,500 uh, households. So we should roughly four to 5,000 people per well. Uh, 
Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. And so how can people, if people want to d- uh, drill a well or contribute to that, how do they do that? Well, we'll give you the website. It's, uh, I'll give that to you. Maybe you can uh, put I'll that. I'll put it in the description box down yes. below there. Uh, so they can look at the website. They can talk to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you will uh, be the bridge between me and them and just to talk and see. And if you want to visit Africa, we'd love to take them for them to go train pastors or come and train government leaders on accountability, integrity, and how to serve God as a, a public of, or, or official. What um, percentage of your Congress do you think are Christians? Well, the problem first in Congo, we have about 60 to 70 percent Christian, 50 percent of them are Catholics. Okay. So most of the congressmen are Catholics. Okay. So I will maybe be half and half because we have some Muslim as well. Okay. Yes. Um, hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I pray that the American church doesn't have to experience <laughs> extreme persecution before it wakes up and um, just genuinely, mm. I don't even know how to say it, just um, enters into a genuine, deep, very real, alive, passionate relationship with mm. the Lord. Mm. That's my hope for America. I really believe it's our only hope. Mm-hmm. I, I see uh, the American society in general as being so dark, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. dark and getting darker, mm-hmm. but there is an awakening happening. I do see that also. Yeah. And as I traveled yes. and speak, I, I mm-hmm. see people coming alive and starting to wake up. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that it's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I pray that it increases rapidly. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. And Amen. And for Congo as well. Definitely. That Definitely. It increases. Thank you. Well, blessings to you, to your family, to Thank the you work so that you're doing, to your two million that mm. you're serving. Mm-hmm. Um, may you be mm. blessed in every way and mm-hmm. may God continue to open mm-hmm. doors for you and mm. and give you wisdom. Mm. And um, mm. may it go well for you. Thank you so much. Got it. Thank you Thank so you. much for your time. Yes, um, absolutely. Blessings to you. you. Blessings to you too. Hey, did you know that I sell products that you can purchase to help support The Rachel Ham Show and keep me producing more content for you? One of my favorites is CBD. This CBD is non-GMO, no synthetics, no fillers. It's American made and it has really improved my life, specifically with arthritis and pain. I also sell Superfoods, which is a line of amazing non-GMO organic products that are grown in California. Everything is American made and it is so, so good. Virusure is one you definitely want to stock up on. It's a vitamin that they make for you to fight off viruses. And with winter coming, definitely a good idea to get some of that. And then of course, I have an amazing vitamin C product. The vitamin C product, which this is all part of the Superfoods line, is non-synthetic. Did you know that most vitamin C that you buy at any store, even vitamin stores, is synthetic? This is vitamin C from nature, all natural. Stock up today. Also, did you know that I wrote a book? Well, I did. I wrote an autobiography and it was a number one bestseller on Amazon. So you might want to check it out. I've had a pretty interesting life, done some pretty wild things, had some pretty amazing experiences, both good and bad, and kind of on both far ends of the spectrum. I've experienced supernatural in both the dark and light camps, and I've written about it. I've also written about my healing journey, and it's encouraging, inspiring, and hopeful. Check it out. You can get it at rachelham.com or on Amazon. And if you buy it on rachelham.com, it just sends you to Amazon. Another product that I have for you is an online course that I created called The Escape Artist, Escaping from the Prison of Fear and Anxiety. In my teens and 20s, I dealt with panic attacks, depression, and severe anxiety that was crippling. At times, I could barely leave my house. But I have been completely set free from that. So I decided to create a course for you to take so I can teach you how I got free from anxiety. So if you or anyone you know or love is struggling with anxiety, be sure and head over to Rachel hand.com go to products and scroll down until you get to the online course and you can watch the little trailer and then enroll if you would like to as well it's a fantastic thing that will set you free all of the links to these things are listed in the description box down below this video and you can also find all of this at rachelham.com 
all of the products I just mentioned are on the products page at rachelham.com. And if you have appreciated what I have done for you with the show and you would like to give back, you can go to givesendgo.com forward slash rachelham, click on give, select the amount that you would like to give. There are a few pre-made ideas. You can also fill in any amount you want. You can also do a single donation or you can make it a monthly gift, which is so, so helpful to me because those monthly gifts make it where I can count on that amount. And I love it and I'm so grateful for it. Fill in your info, click continue, and you're done. For other ways to give, just go to rachelham.com, click on the little menu bar, and go down to Appreciate Rachel's Work, Give Here. Click on that, and then it will take you to this page where you can see the five different ways you can give. There's the Give, Send, Go link, so you can just click on that, Cash App, of course, PayPal still, Venmo, and you can click on any of those links to take you directly there. If you'd like to mail a gift, there's my mailing address. And from the bottom of my heart, I genuinely thank you for supporting me and my show. May you be blessed 100 fold. Be sure and like this video if you found it to be useful. And if you haven't already, be sure and subscribe to The Rachel Ham Show on Rumble and YouTube. Hey, let's connect. I am at The Rachel Ham on all media platforms. Thank you for watching. God bless you and know that you are loved.